Hello. We have a recording in progress. <laughs> then we have on the screen, we have Gavin Esler, who, uh, former Newsnight, various campaigny journalist thing. You can tell that I know exactly what I'm talking about. Gavin and Dominic, thank you very much for coming well, and speaking to us today. Can I start with Dominic? I can't this, will it work? I think so. Dominic, would you be able to just tell us a little bit about democracy and your views yes, on it? And there it is at the moment. And then Gavin after that. Over to... Thank you very much. Hello, Gavin. Um, Hi. Welcome to all online and to all of you here this morning. And thank you so much for <clears throat> inviting me uh, to this AGM. And I was reflecting it may be the state of the world in late November, <clears throat> a period of remembrance. Um, that one starts to reflect upon the condition of one's own country and something of its past. And so rather than just talking about what I think unlock democracy usually talks about, which is about reform to our democratic processes, I'd like to come on to that very briefly at the end and in discussion. I just thought it might be worth taking a moment's pause about where we are and how we have got to where we are. I confess that I find something quite depressing about the current state of politics, which is its fundamental irrationality. Um, I find it extraordinary, for example, that my own political party, which has a long, or we say old, own, I'm not a member of it anymore, but I was for 47 years, I think, which, of course, you may have disagreements about its policies, but we always anchored itself on principles of rationality, has succeeded for at least five to six years, I might argue longer, to have abandoned any objective rational analysis of how a country should be governed. Um, leading in a sort of terminal, I hope it was the terminal moment for this particular trend, to the premiership of this trust and an attempt to carry out what could only be described as fantasy economics, born in part actually of despair, because the despair was that nothing was working and that therefore if you did this extraordinary thing of borrowing heaps of money and, and uh, lowering taxes, it would be the transformational moment which would deliver the magical future for the United Kingdom, which I have to accept, I'm sure she actually believed it. But she's not unique. We haven't got there just through one or two such incidents. In fact, if you look back over 25 years, most of the things have, that have gone wrong in this country have happened when politicians have quite open eyed made decisions which actually, and I was part of some of this, probably look in hindsight extremely irrational. And Mrs Thatcher, who undoubtedly was a great reforming prime minister, but towards the end, she made two very big mistakes. One was over the way in which she started to see the taxation system as represented by the poll tax, which undermined her. And secondly, and I think very interestingly, her attitude to the European Union, she felt to have been the creator of the single market in 1986, but then out of frustration for the way in which the EU was working, and I shared that frustration, she started in fact subtly to undermine it and our role in it and to actually open the door to people who extremely irrationally started to consider that we had a better future outside and finally persuaded a substantial chunk of the electorate, majority of the voting electorate, to vote for it. And we are living with the consequences of this massive irrational decision. Tony Blair made his own errors. Iraq was a great error, but there were also others. And we can watch this happen. Now, when we're talking about unlocking democracy, we have to ask ourselves the question, what is the democracy that we're trying to unlock? If it is the democracy of majority vote, uh, then as we saw with the Brexit referendum, it can lead to serious consequences. And I have to say this, because I cooperated very closely with members of the SNP at Westminster, but I happen to think that their desire for Scottish independence is 
in logical terms, utterly irrational. It will not deliver any of the things that they're aiming for, and yet they believe in it. And what seems to me to happen, and is still happening, is that we, not just as politicians, but society and the public, and I think most culpably in many ways the media, engage in continuous displacement activity over what the real issues actually are. Mm -hmm. So even when Jeremy Hunt stands up in the House of Commons to deliver what seems to me was a very rational budget, admittedly a very harsh one, still couldn't actually articulate what some of the underlying problems were. And more remarkably, the Labour opposition standing up on the other side couldn't do it either. So in my introductory remarks, I want to chuck out to you for that conversation. <coughs> How is it that we change this? Of course, part of it is about education. If you have an educated and sophisticated electorate, they are likely to be better at analysing the promises made by politicians. And we've also got to accept the fact that politics has always been, I'm afraid, quite a lot of bread and circuses. Although with uh, Mr Johnson, you can see where bread and circuses get you. How do we change that? And how do we bring about the sort of reforms which are not just another piece of displacement activity, dare I say it, but actually deliver some better goal rather than just necessarily being a goal in themselves. And so when we talk particularly about electoral reform, which I happen to believe in, the justification for it, or the only justification for it, must be that as a result of doing it, people are prepared to accept in a democratic society that politics is much more about compromise and adjustments mm -hmm. than about the delivery of set out programs. So that's what I wanted to talk about. I thought could chuck into the mix this morning because otherwise it seems to me that we're in danger of mm -hmm. missing what is going so badly wrong. And before we get too depressed, all countries suffer from but I have to say, the UK seems to me to be suffering from it more than most at the moment, and it is making us poorer, it's threatening our future, and it's threatening our ability to influence the world in a positive way. And we have to do something about it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That's a lot of food for thought, some of which is what's the core of democracy, some of which is also what is the rationality? And I'm currently trying to work out what, what percentage I would consider myself rational versus yeah. emotional and mm. which part of me makes the political decisions. And mm. I am certain it's not the rational one all the time. But before we think about that, uh, can I move over to Gavin? Uh, Gavin, democracy and the future of the United Kingdom. What are your thoughts here? Thank you. Can, uh, can everybody hear me all right? Is that okay? Yeah, good. Um, I'm going to begin with uh, a couple of ut utterly shocking statements. The first is, I agree with almost everything Dominic has just said. So <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to look for something that we disagree with, uh, dis disagree about. I absolutely agree. And that we also practice the politics of distraction, which means that because we cannot face up to can't even face up to the B word Brexit until recently, we now say, oh, look over there, it's something else that we, we have to fix. And I think uh, that is quite appalling. Uh, we're not quite the American route and Trumpism and denying election victories and so on, but we are, we're a little bit on the same road, unfortunately. It's a worldwide phenomenon and we have to, uh, we'll come back to that, I'm sure. Um, one, of, one of the I think actually quite nice things about having been on on television for quite a lot of my my life is that strangers come up to me uh, and and occasionally ask kind of weird questions. And a couple of weeks ago, I was on a train back down yeah. here to Kent, and somebody said to me, um, "Taking part." Or... Sorry, I'm hearing somebody else there. Who's, um, keep, keep going, having... <laughs> keep going, Sean. Will, Sean will work it out. Okay. Um, uh, on the train. Uh, one of the fellow passengers came up to me and said, tell me, which Muppet is going to be Prime Minister by Christmas? <laughs> now, <laughs> what, what struck me about that conversation was um, that if you actually, 
the, the answer is embedded in the question, actually. Uh, I mean, I know a lot of politicians, and I'm, I'm pleased to say I've, I've met Dominic on a few occasions, and I admire him greatly. I admire many, many of our politicians who go through some very difficult decisions. Uh, and in Dominic's case, it was one which ended his, uh, his career within the Conservative Party, and I regret that. Um, but if you believe that we are governed by Muppets, then the identity of the Muppet in chief possibly doesn't matter so much. It's a system which allows people who are considered to be Muppets to get to the top. Uh, and I'm not going to particularly go into um, uh, details, but it then struck me, how do you get to be Gavin Williamson? I mean, how do you actually? Um, because, oh, uh, or or Chris Grayling. I mean, Gavin Williamson has been forced to resign or remove from high political office by three prime ministers in four years. This is very odd. This doesn't happen in other businesses or, uh, you know, uh, in fact, Leila Moran, the uh, Liberal Democrat MP, tweeted, Gavin Williamson is the 80th minister to have resigned or been sacked in 2022. If this were a school, it would be in special measures. If it were a company, it would be in administration. Yet, yet this is our chaotic, conservative, as it happens, government. Um, so we can, in the American phrase, throw the rascals out and do something about that. But it does seem to me that systemic change, and this is one of the reasons why I'm very happy to be here, um, is both difficult but necessary. It's difficult, I would suggest, because when you mention the word constitution to a British audience, I can see the eyes tend to glaze over. Not this audience, I suspect, but for many audiences, they go, what do you mean? If you ask, how do you get to be Gavin Williamson? They pick up and actually start thinking that there may be something of in this systemic change that we need to address. In terms of Kent, which I uh, love and I, I know uh, a couple of our MPs uh, reasonably well and I think they do a great job whether we agree or disagree they are basically honest decent people most of them as far as I know the ones I've met but there are 17 constituencies in Kent 16 have conservative MPs and one has a Labour MP to get a conservative MP you need 33,000 votes to get one Labour MP you need nearly quarter of a million votes and to get a Liberal Democrat MP, I don't know how many you would need, but 92,000 votes in Kent, and I'm talking about the 2019 election, got nobody. Not only that, um, it, this is a was uh, somewhat a UKIP area. I'm in Deal in Kent, and East Kent was, uh, you know, where Nigel Farage uh, had his roots in many ways. And 3.8 million of our fellow citizens in 2015 voted UKIP and got nothing, or next to nothing. They got Douglas Carswell, who then quit the party, and so they did get nothing. And I've talked to some of those voters, uh, perfectly honest, decent people whom I happen to disagree with, and one of them said to me, the trouble is they never listen, whoever they are, they never listen, and my vote is always wasted. And I know he voted for Brexit in 2016 uh, for perhaps that reason. And the other part of this is that we have a chaotic constitutional system, which has, you know, Lord Frost said, we, um, how's it, how did, what did he say? It just evolved, which is, of course, nonsense. I mean, you know, suffragism and the bombings that went on didn't just evolve. The 1832 of Reform Act didn't just evolve, or 1707 and the, 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 un, the Act of Union and so on. Um, it was something which, uh, has gone through various crises in the past. And what we have got at the moment is Peter Kellner, the pollster says, six different electoral systems in this United Kingdom of ours. So we've got the one in Scotland, uh, Wales and Northern Ireland. We've got the Westminster system. We've got referendums, uh, which is obviously a reasonably uh, new innovation. And in Kellner's case, he also points out that the hereditaries in the House of Lords have this very, very peculiar system for electing or re-electing a few of them to keep them in, in power. So it's, we sort of have this very British notion that this brings stability <laughs> and that we somehow muddle through. Um, well, I would suggest that, and this is where I think Dominic and I will completely agree, um, we muddle, but we don't necessarily muddle through. We're certainly muddling now, and it most certainly doesn't bring stability. And one of the things that 
um, motivates me and motivated me to write a book called How Britain Ends uh, was not that that was a recommendation, but it's an observation that the different parts of our United Kingdom are moving in different directions. And the only slight difference I would have with um, uh, what Dominic said there is he said uh, Scottish independence uh, would be irrational because it wouldn't deliver what people think it would deliver. I suppose my quibble would be it depends what you think they think it will deliver. And when I talk to SNP people who are actually seem perfectly rational, um, they always say they understood there were three reasons why Scottish independence wouldn't work. Uh, one was because <clears throat> it mean leaving the European Union. Well, <laughs> For them, it now means we will get back, we, Scotland in their case, will get back into the European Union. Uh, the second reason is essentially it's too much fuss because what we do about pensions, how would we manage the border? How would we do all this? And many of them think that given the events of this year of 2022 and the way Ireland, poor little Ireland is now much richer GDP per capita than the United Kingdom, that may or may not have gone. We could de debate that. And the third reason, which they don't talk about very much, but publicly, but I would say is a real problem, is what do you do if a Scottish independence vote is very close and they win by 50% plus one or 52, 48, as we've seen with Brexit? How do you manage that? So it's not entirely irrational, I think, if what you are saying is um, it won't be the promised land, but we will escape this Westminster system, which clearly doesn't work, which was invented in the era of the horse and cart and is completely out of date in the 21st century of the information age and so on. So I, I'm, I'm going to leave it there. But I think uh, the, the Muppet question we can discuss, but it's actually about a system which allows certain people to get to the top, including, in my view, Boris Johnson, who are clearly unsuitable. And for many MPs, within the Conservative Party were certainly not the person that they would have put in Downing Street. Thank you, Thank you very much, Gavin. Uh, I'm definitely taking uh, that Muppet question away. <laughs> Personally, I wouldn't mind Kermit the Frog being in charge. <laughs> it feels a lot like we've got Gonzo in charge, and I'm not quite sure that's where we want to be at all. Um, so some of these questions are very much about the system, you know, how we muddle through despite the system, in fact, at the moment. And sometimes we are not getting through at all. We're just getting stuck there. And again, we get back to this question of rationality and we get back to the question of what democracy is. So it's sort of what are we trying to save? What's the core of democracy? So perhaps if Dominic might want to think first about what the what the core of democracy is, and then perhaps you may agree, Gavin, or you may disagree. Well, well, stand, up, stand up again, because otherwise I can't be seen by Gavin. <laughs> um, it, the core of the democratic process is actually, to my mind, the ability to transition between governments without violence. I mean, that is a fundamental uh, attraction. And countries that don't have it eventually transition by violence between one form of government and another. Um, democracy is, however, much more than that, because as I always say when I used to go and speak to six formers, it's not about the imposition of majority decisions on minorities. It's about a process of debate that enables minorities to accept majority decision making, which is a very different thing. And you only have to go to Northern Ireland as an example of a society that had broken down because there was a significant minority that would not accept majority decisions in the 19, late 1960s and 70s. Um, you, otherwise, it was a democracy in that sense, even though there were gerrymandered boundaries and various other things. But nevertheless, that's what it was. And it didn't work. Um, so I think one has to recognise that democracy, I think it was as Winston Churchill said, is the least bad form of government available. Yeah. The disadvantage is, perhaps hinting back at some of the things I was talking about, is it does mean that somebody who can get popular or populist appeal uh, can seduce large sections of the electorate 
uh, into taking decisions, which, as I say, in my view, may well have a very irrational base to it. And that is one of the, the things that one has to accept is factored in. That's then very dependent on the quality of the politicians, dare I say it, to an extent, the quality of the commentators and media, as to whether they are trying to support a process of rational decision making and therefore tempered by moderation or not. Because clearly, if moderation breaks down, democracy will break down with it. Look what was happening in the United States with Trump. It came on the face of it very close on the 6th of January um, to what looked like almost a coup d'etat. So um, to me, democracy is about how you slide those tectonic plates and bring about change by <coughs> consent. That doesn't mean that everybody is always going to consent to everything. And I think it's worth bearing in mind that our forebears knew quite a lot about this. But if you go to the House of Lords at the very end of a passage of a controversial bill, the leaders of the political parties in the Lords all put on this wonderful robe. I was about to say fancy dress, but that's unfair. They act out the Constitution, and as the Lords Commissioners, they come and doff their hats and say, the King, we now have, wants it, thereby not only implying the King's assent, but their own assent, and that of the political parties they represent, to the legislation that has just been passed. So, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater either, because there are, in fact, some really rather good things within our constitution unwritten, which mark this out. But at the end of the day, you cannot have a democracy unless there is a framework within which people can operate, and they know that that framework would be exceeded. That's what we call conventions which Boris Johnson was so adept at ripping up. So to me, that is what the, how a working democracy can operate, but it has its drawbacks as well as its undoubted advantages, but there is no other system that works. Thank you. Now I'm going to ask the same question to Gavin, then I'll probably ask another one, and then I will uh, suggest that people suggest some subjects for, yeah. uh, for us to talk about. So, Gavin, the core of democracy, the, um, the bit which is the baby and not the bathwater, what do you think that is? What's the well, important bit? Well, I, th I think one of the things that really struck me over the past couple of months was something extraordinary uh, that happened in, the, in Britain that we should congratulate ourselves for in a slightly different way, which is that within one week, we changed our head of state and we changed our head of government and the only gunfire I heard were the cannons celebrating King Charles III. That is, when you think about it, around the world, pretty amazing. There were a few people who shouted and protested, as is their right, and generally they were pretty unpopular. But I thought that was, uh, I'm not saying that necessarily Liz Truss become Prime Minister was one of the best uh, things that ever happened, but the fact that the transitions took place is extraordinary. But to me, the heart of democracy is if people can say, are my views represented? Am I seeing my views represented? And is there a degree of, there'll never be complete agreement, but is there a degree of consensus about big issues that we can move forward on? And therefore what worries me is, um, uh, is the third of, a, third of our population who don't vote, who are somehow turned off, and that we then have parliamentary landslides, as we had in 2019, and the same was true, by the way, of Tony Blair going back many years, but we have par parliamentary landslides. Uh, as we all know, Boris Johnson's majority of 80 in December 2019 was, was based on 43.6% of those who voted, but if you strip out those who didn't vote, it was actually 29% of the voting age population. So 71% of us either couldn't be bothered or voted for somebody else. And of course, the largest party in Scotland is the SNP. In Northern Ireland, it was the DUP. It's now Sinn Féin, which was the entire Northern Ireland was set up precisely to pre prevent that happening. And in Wales, it's Labour. So the, the different parts of our country uh, have not entirely assented to it. And so when I read things like... Uh, uh, this was a landslide victory and Boris Johnson's a vote winner, you have to look back again, this is this is Peter Kellner's uh, research, he, he pointed out 
that at the time of the December 2019 election, Boris Johnson had a net unpopularity rating of minus 20, but Jeremy Corbyn's net unpopularity rating was minus 44. Now I'm well aware that, I'm well aware that um, this is simply how our system works, but the reason it works, and this is a, a pick up uh, Dominic's point, I think, is, well, there's nothing in the American written constitution that says a president should concede gracefully if he loses an election, but you expect that to happen. And it happened even with Al Gore uh, 20 years ago or so, who could have contested, I think on some grounds, the Florida result, because it was very, very dodgy. But he, in the end, it has decided, and the Supreme Court decided it wasn't worth it. So he conceded gracefully. Donald Trump not doing that broke a great norm of behavior in our country. And Boris Johnson, who lost two, you know, you what, what was it? Um, Oscar Wilde wrote to uh, to to lose one parent is a misfortune. To lose two suggests like carelessness. Well, Boris Johnson lost two ethics advisors. He lost two ethics advisors because he didn't. They they had to resign. They had to resign because he didn't follow the basic norms that we expect of our prime minister, and that puts democracy, uh, British democracy in difficulty. As I think many of you know the, the good chap theory of government. Peter Hennessy said, well, and it was slightly tongue in cheek, uh, the good chaps know when to quit effectively. And it was always chaps. Well, it's not always chaps now, but they're not always good either. And it seems to me, um, and I've talked to Hannah White from the Institute for Government recently about this, that the, if the norms of behavior have changed, and I would say they certainly have changed, and the abuses are there in ways that don't seem to live up to what we traditionally think people should do, then we have to think of different ways of reining in this bad behavior. And we haven't come up with it yet because in effect, we have a system where the prime minister can be judge and jury in his own court. And when Sue Gray reports, she reports to, uh, and by the way, I think Lord Guy, Alex Allen and Sue Gray did a great job actually. But when you report to somebody who just ignores you, what do we do as British citizens? Because that is a major failing in our democracy. And if it was someone less indolent and more ideological than Boris Johnson, we could be in real trouble. Thanks very much. So if I could come back to Gavin first and then Dominic, there's something there, you know, you were talking about the norms of behavior and how things change. And earlier, you spoke about your, the, um, the way that the systems worked as well. Now, you've both spoken about rational decision making. We as human beings, we're living in a world which is a social reality, which is not always rational. We are, you know, we are human and a lot of our lived reality is an emotional reality rather than a rational one. Um, there's something interesting about computers and the frame problem. And you know, when you've got, uh, you know, uh, robots find it difficult to do a lot of everyday tasks because they can't frame it within the context in which it exists. So I wonder, seeing as we as humans are quite emotional beings and that we we go into politics using all of that emotions as well, you know, we bring our anger and our fear as well as uh, our rationality, how, how do we make the systems how do we make those rational when we're so so illogical sometimes? Well, I, uh, in terms of emotion, I think I think that's great. Actually, I think to be emotional about about things, to be uh, you know, when when I saw this case about Rochdale and a you know two year old dying because of because of mold, you, you <laughs> should be angry about that, shouldn't we? Uh, uh, but there is a systemic failure behind that, uh, which. You know, I don't know the details, but I think anger is fine or, 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 you know, affection or whatever. I think that bit is good. Our difficulty, it seems to me, is a very, is a very 21st century uh, difficulty, which is why I think the, the, uh, the system has not yet caught up, which is that when you have an American president whose spokesperson said, uh, oh, well, there are alternative facts. 
And when we live in a world in which lying has become normalized in public life, unfortunately, and you know, we all tell lies. I, you know, I, I would ask everybody in the room who, you know, have you ever ticked that box that said you've read the terms and conditions of something? <laughs> Have you? Has anybody ever put, put your hand up? Have you ever read the? I've never read the terms and conditions. Never, ever. Sorry. So, 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 so I lie clearly, but but the normalization of it in in big matters and being confronted with things means that that uh, when facts are disputed, uh, we don't seem to to get to the bottom of it, and therefore the big lie and and the very clever way in which the the, the message on the bus was presented in in 2016 it was very very clever. Dominic Cle Cummings is a very clever chap, and we're all still talking about that 350 million for a week for the NHS. Uh, which was nonsense, but he changed our debate, and the rest of us haven't quite caught up with it. And so I think I think there's a number of issues here. One is for the media, uh, but it's not just the media. But uh, the the qu I um, I'm a great admirer of, of you know, John Sopel, who's a, a friend of mine, and he did a marvelous job uh, in in Washington. But how on earth can you report on the American presidency of Donald Trump without saying? By the way, the Washington Post calculated he told 30,000 lies during the course of his presidency. <laughs> <laughs> now, I mean, did he not have a day off? That's that's that's, <laughs> a, that's a, you check the figures. Have a ha, have a look. Google. I mean, I they're not my figures. And how do you do the same thing with Boris Johnson when he's telling you that what you are seeing is not what's happening? It's it's like that old Marx Brothers joke. Who are you going to believe, me or your own eyes? And sometimes you have to believe your own eyes and we haven't got around that I'm, I'm i'm sort of not i hope i'm not dodging the question but i'm trying to suggest it's a difficult one for all of us as citizens it's difficult for the media and it's difficult in parliament as well given i i completely understand why you can't call somebody a liar in parliament i, I completely get that but there has to be some kind of truth checking and fact checking if we're going to have get away from as uh, as dominic said the irrationality of some of the things that we're doing thanks that's not dodging the uh, the question at all i mean so as a campaigner i know the value of anger sometimes mm. you know if you're talking to your audience and you want to you want people to be upset because there is something mm -hmm. to be upset about then anger is a very powerful motivator but if I can throw it to Dominic then about this, this gap somewhat between the systems we want to create, um, you know, our own nature, how do we make, how do we make good systems then? How do we create a good rational systems? Well, it's difficult <laughs> and, and, and let's face it, emotion and irrationality are ingrained in our DNA and, and the politicians ignore public emotions then they're not going to last very long. Mm -hmm. um, let's take, take a really difficult and controversial issue which is immigrants landing on beaches not very far from Gavin. Mm -hmm. um, significant statistically it's not a huge number compared to the number who we're bringing in anyway but in emotional terms it plays out really badly with a, a large section of the British electorate who perceive that the government has lost control of our borders and that people are coming in who we would not otherwise allow in and don't have an entitlement to asylum in. Because in actual practical terms, they're simply immigrants. Um, that's a very difficult question. The response of Suella is to sort of try to outpace her electorate in her sense of outrage. But you have to decide where your limits are. If this were North Korea, it's very simple. We would send out a gunboat and machine gun these people in the water, because that's actually what North Korea has done to illegal immigrants who tried to land in North Korea. Why anybody should want to go there is not. <laughs> and, and that brought it to a halt. But on the whole, I suspect if you were to go out in the streets and ask the United Kingdom electorate if they thought that was the correct solution to the problem, they would say to you that was a terrible thing to do. Thank goodness. Um, that then begs the question, if that's a terrible thing to do, what rationally can we do about this? Well, the answer is we have to cooperate with the French, which appears to be something which we have had great difficulty doing for the last six years. We have to look at some of the root causes. We might try to streamline returns for people from Albania, because they're a country which, on the whole, you can't pay a political asylum from. 
But you also have to tell people that you can't actually find a magic solution which is going to stop this completely. But you try hearing that at Westminster, you will not get it. You won't even get it from Labour. Labour will go around saying, oh, you failed in this, you failed in that, you failed in the other. But in fairness, they're in the position, so they are certainly not going to come up with an alternative when probably they know secretly that no sensible alternative or very easy alternative exists. So, yes, I mean, I do accept that emotion, and emotion can sometimes be an uplifting moment in politics. It can be the tipping point for doing something which is really important. And after all, in wartime, you see with the Ukrainians, and they're clearly driven by emotion as well as a degree of cold rationality, but without that emotion, they would not have sustained and protected themselves from this appalling attack on them by the Russian state. So, of course it matters, and politics have got, politicians have got to be able to generate emotion. But as I say, I come back, I think this is where this conversation is leading, to how can we structure this into a more mature debate, particularly in Parliament and particularly out of Parliament into the surrounding media? Now, you know, we've been touching on it, we are unlocked, this is unlocked democracy, after all, we're talking about electoral reform. <laughs> can we craft a system of proportional representation, which produces more of that dialogue and actually requires it than we have at the moment. And, and I strike this cautionary note, can we do it in a way which doesn't lead to the Israeli model, where in fact extremist parties dominate because everything becomes so fragmented that you are putting together coalitions, you're forced to put together coalitions with people with whom, quite frankly, you would not really wish to spend any part of the day. And I think, and would that make a positive contribution compared to the current system where historically the two main political parties have tended to absorb the dissent within their ranks and control it while still allowing it to influence some areas of policy? But this does appear to have broken down. And that's another interesting question. Why has it broken down so much? Why have <clears throat> the, people say the lunatics taken over the asylum, but the, there is a sense in both our main political parties in the last 10 years that there have been trends towards extreme views becoming dominant, which previously were kept under, they were there, and sometimes they could be quite a positive force but they were kept reasonably under control. And that's something which we seem to have lost. And one of the reasons why I changed my mind about proportional representation, because once that's gone, it doesn't seem to me that the first past the post system has any justification at all. Um, but, but if we're going to argue for that change, and also potentially for other democratic processes to be unlocked within our country, including more devolution, more popular participation, we have to make sure that we've actually got an art and have articulated a structure which is viable and is going to make a positive difference. Because otherwise, we're simply going to bring about more chaotic change and we won't actually deliver the results. That seems like it feeds very nicely into, yes, let's yes. write down the structure. <laughs> How about we have a nice structure written down somewhere? Because if it's written down, it becomes slightly more real. Or Personally, I think it's a good idea to write these things down. Um, so there have been some questions in the chat here, and I've taken one of those and mashed it seamlessly, I'm sure, into what I was just asking there. But I'd also like to ask people here whether you had some questions. So I think I'll take two questions, then Dominic, then Gavin, and then let's see where we are in terms of time. Yeah. Sorry. So, um, there's also Sean has got some questions online. Um, and we might find that the first of those follows on briefly from what you just said excellent. about writing things down. In that case, let's have two questions, then I will see whether I can fit in some of this. So, uh, right at the back, I mean, yes, 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 please. Um, I would like to know what people think about the role of uh, people's assemblies. Uh, to try and discuss the point of uh, proportional representation and constitutional change. Okay, so what is the, what is the, you know, what role can people's assemblies play there in discussing proportional representation, constitutional change? And I am going to 
Call our Mr. Here. Okay, okay. My, my name is Michael I just like to say two things. Um, in 1964, Marshall McLuhan wrote a book called The Media Is the Message. And mm -hmm. um, never more so is that true. Yeah, yeah. In 1959, Bertrand Russell was asked what two messages he would like to pass on to future generations. And he said, The first is, I like people to deal with the facts, not what you'd like the facts to be, what you believe them to be. And this is getting ever more difficult for us to find the facts, to verify, to put our checks and balances in place in life. The second point I want to make is this. We are globally, everyone is unhappy under their political systems. I can't actually think of a country Many countries have better um, political uh, voting systems than we do. They're all unhappy. My friends in Italy, Germany, they're unhappy. And um, I would like us to consider this. When we go to vote, primarily what we're doing is we are endorsing the institutional design by that action of voting. Forget who you vote for. The primary action is one of endorsement, which leads to us electing governments which have party affiliations. More often than not, we have adversarial politics. We do not have informed deliberation. And this is something we keep on endorsing by the action of voting. The politicians know this only too well. I would suggest very quickly. Very quickly, please. <laughs> that we do. Lady over there mentioned that we have something like a governor, an adjunct to parliament, as a citizens' assembly, which decides on some matters in an informed way that party politics can't sort out. Thank you. I'd like to add to that um, the <coughs> process for. Um, to achieving major change and particularly, you know, so one of the questions we've had online you know, was that many constitutions require a two thirds majority to achieve major change. Right. You know, if you look at a, a local government, for example, you know, a lot of councils require a two thirds majority to say, you know, change their, um, change their, their structures. Um, you know, that seems like a, fairly appropriate principle, you know, if you have a change such as, you know, we've had referendums about leaving the EU, you know, about uh, um, Scottish independence, you know, it feels that 50% and then one either way doesn't quite meet it. So, you know, perhaps if we could think a little bit about what, you know, what would feel appropriate, you know, how do we achieve such major change? But if I come to Dominic first, and so we've got three, uh, three different prompts there. Um, excuse me if I look this way so my voice carries that way. <laughs> uh, my apologies. So firstly, the People's Assembly role with constitutional change and PR. Secondly, this around, you know, finding the facts, checking what the facts are. You know, when you vote for someone, you're endorsing someone, should we have something like a People's Assembly? And then thirdly, around the change, you know, the majority needed to achieve change. Dominic, your thoughts on that wide range of prompts? It is a wide range of prompts. I'm certainly in favour of, I have no objection to the idea of citizens' assemblies to discuss constitutional change. For example, we want to introduce PR, uh, and we think that's a good idea, then having People's assemblies with some discussions around the country about what the implications are, some of the things I was talking about a moment ago, the pros and cons of it, so as to try to build a degree of public consent for that change and also feed in the public's views to the process seems to me to be very valuable. And on the whole, I think the subsystems are more valuable than holding referendums. Um, I, I am uh, I am not a fan of referendums. I, I can see that referendums on quite simple binary questions at the end of debate when something can be implemented can serve a purpose of going to the public and asking for them to make the decision rather than Parliament making it. 
an act can have some merit, but as with, that's the difference between what I would call the Irish system over abortion and what we did in the UK over Brexit, which was to ask a vague question or a wish, and then um, nobody really knowing what it meant to implement it. It would have been better if David Cameron wanted to go down that road to have some citizens' assemblies for discussing and then feed into Parliament what Parliament thought we should now do in the light of his negotiation. Um, I also think that they would be very valuable if we have PR and indeed other constitutional change. I mean, you may have noticed I haven't gone on very much about written constitutions, and I am not altogether persuaded that they are a good thing. And this may make me at variance with some of you in this room. Um, light touch constitutions can, I think, quite work. I mean, at one stage I was trying to work up a Bill of Rights, not RAB's Bill of Rights, but a Bill of Rights uh, which would include the Human Rights Act undiluted and with some other things added on, which were sort of defining characteristics of the British state. And I thought that might be quite useful back in the sort of period 2010 in getting people to accept the Human Rights Act, for example. Um, and I think that if you could, that could be quite val possibly valuable, but everything I've seen since then makes me think that achieving written constitutions can just get very finickety and not really deliver. The question is, can you put in structures that work and can you build upon existing structures? Now, the last question comment came up was that somehow you could have citizens' assemblies as a counterbalance to Parliament. I have to say, I'm not persuaded by that. I think citizens' assemblies may have a role in informing Parliament about the decisions it makes, but I don't think you can have a substitute power centre because I'm not really sure in my mind how that would work. Clearly, reform of the House of Lords, which is a big topic, you know, a lot of democracy, uh, and what role the House of Lords actually plays could dovetail with that. Um, but it also raises some quite problematical issues about what the Lords are actually there to do. And you need to sort out what the Lords are there to do before you decide who should be in the Lords doing it. Thank you. Can I move to... Gavin, then again, the same three prompts, you know, firstly about the People's Assembly role, you know, which is in constitutional change and also PR, then uh, this suggestion, you know, that it could be part of the, uh, you know, sort of, well, it could be semi detached from government in some way, then again, the constitutional change, you know, requiring two thirds majority. What yes. would you like to do with those three prompts? <laughs> um, well, I, I very, very simply, I'd, I'd like to agree with Dominic. Uh, Citizens' Assembly is good. I'm not a fan of referendums either, especially if it is not as it was in Northern Ireland, a 30 page document called the Good Friday Agreement, or we call it that, uh, and everybody knew what they were voting for. The Brexit referendum was an absolute disaster because everybody had a different version of it. <laughs> uh, in terms of written constitutions, I'm slightly more of a fan in the sense that at least if we had a a kind of uh we have well we have a written constitution as dominic knows in the sense that we've got lots of bits written down um they're uncodified but it would be quite good given devolution to have a kind of basic law which says the center will do this and other parts will do something else uh, and particularly england has lost out in that written constitutions clearly don't always work, not just in the fact that you have to obey certain norms, but Russia's got an absolutely brilliant written constitution. And when I, I interviewed a, uh, for a, a podcast series called The Big Steel about Putin's various crimes, uh, a young woman called Olga Misik, who in 2019 read out the Russian constitution and was immediately arrested because it says we have the right to freedom of assembly, you have the right to demonstrate, you have the right to hold various views. So written constitutions are not a panacea, but actually having some kind of roadmap slightly more organized than we've got. But the, the other thing, uh, I was really struck by Dominic's point about dodgy coalitions, because I think this is, uh, he mentioned Israel, and that, that you there are all kinds of problems. One of the things I was thinking about, though, is we already have two dodgy coalitions in, in Britain. One's called the Conservative Party and the other's called the Labour Party. <laughs> um, you know, and uh, the Conservatives, uh, there's a party within the party called the European Research Group, which has been a bit of a tail wagging a dog for far too long, in my view. 
And I won't say who he was, but it was a former Labour leader who once said to me, you realise our party, the Labour Party, uh, is, uh, has three groups, intellectuals, <laughs> trade unions and the left. And the intellectuals run the party, the trade unions pay for it, and the left are allowed to talk a lot, but are never must never be allowed to get into power. Now, that is not the case more recently, <laughs> as, as we've seen. And one other thing I would say is, to go back to the, the, the core of much of this, is why, why doesn't, why isn't a more, um, a fairer system of elections of the type used in that good enough for people in Wales and Scotland and Northern Ireland. Why isn't that in the United Kingdom as a whole? And I asked one former civil servant who was there uh, a number of years ago, and he said to me, oh, well, the reason is 179. I said, I, what do you mean the reason we don't have proportional representation is 179? He said, oh, well, that was Tony Blair's majority in 1997. And once you have ascended the ladder, it's all fine what you might think in opposition. But as soon as you get into power, you think this system must be pretty good because it got me here. Now, I think there's a, I think that is the, a very important point. And if Labour wins the next election, I wouldn't hold my breath for uh, electoral reform because Sir Keir Starmer would say, well, it's good enough to get me here. So why should we change things? So it's a hard sell is, is what I'm, I'm trying to say. And people have other, other concerns uh, that are connected with the way in which we uh, elect people. So all the citizens assemblies uh, that we were began this conversation, this part of the conversation with, have to do is continue to hold public representatives' feet to the fire and say, we need change. But once those public representatives are offered ministerial positions in a government which has been elected by a thumping majority, it might not happen. Can I, so, thank you, Gavin, can I follow up with you about some of that? And I've got another question here, which I'm scribbling various bits of it on, uh, working out. So, <coughs> Supposing that we did introduce a fairer system, you know, supposing that that proportional representation, let's not think too much about which type of PR, you know, but let's imagine that we had a much more proportional system came in. What would be the effect then upon our current way of doing politics? Would those broad churches split up? Um, would we see the debating system which we use within Parliament? You know, would that change to be less of a, you know, this person says this, we, you know, less of the minister says this, the official opposition says this, minister responds, etc. you know, that we have at the moment. Would we get more citizens' assemblies? Would we see people's voting intentions shift towards some of the smaller parties? So that's really actually four questions about voting intention shifting, larger parties shifting up, debating system change, and things like citizens' assemblies. Yeah, I think, think? Well, I, well, I, well, I think uh, a number of things about that. Yes, I think, uh, I think parties would split in the end. I think they would uh, change very, very radically. I think there would be coalitions of the willing for various, uh, for, for, for various things. Um, but I just let me give you one example. I, uh, I, I did something a couple of years ago in for the uh, for the British Property Federation in Scotland. There was a big, big planning row going on, and I was asked to chair something which involved a chap called Derek, Derek Mackay, who's the finance minister in Scotland, uh, who's SNP, and there were a whole number of people involved in in building projects, and they were very, very angry about some bill, the details of which I can't remember, and they were very hostile. And they wanted to put questions to the minister. And I thought, I wonder how he's going to deal with this. So I sat down and Mr. Mackay stood up and he said, I agree with all those criticisms of our bill on planning regulations coming in. But the reason those uh, parts that you object to are in there are because we have had to reach a consensus with the Green Party, because at the moment we, the SNP, do not have majority here. So don't, don't talk to me talk to them. Now, I'm not saying that um, PR gives an excuse to politicians to dodge the question. He was right, actually. Uh, it was put in. These, these bits were put in. I can't remember the details. What I'm trying to say is that we already have 
coalitions in various ways, but two big parties. And there's a kind of illusion that there's one or the other, whereas they are, there are big debates, as Dominic would know better than I, um, I do, uh, within, within the parties. And obviously the coalition system in, Ger in Germany, for example, works sometimes. I think it's not working very well now. My German relatives say it's not particularly, they're not very happy with it. It's no panacea, but at least the, instead of being a coalition within a party hidden within the fact that you're all members of the same party and have it all in back rooms, it would be more open. It would never be perfect. And there would be the risk, I'm afraid, as, as Dominic said, that a UKIP type party would have a, a, a big slice of, of a future government. But you could say that a UKIP group within the Conservative Party has had a very big voice. Thank you. Thanks very much. And so, Dominic, supposing that we had PR implemented, do you think that larger parties would split up? Would the debating system change? Would we get more citizens' assemblies? Should that be the catalyst? I, I certainly agree with Gavin that I think that uh, the political party system would start to break up. And inevitably, firstly, there are some parties which are essentially unrepresented in Parliament at the moment that would have MPs. So you have to expect that UKIP would have uh, representation, whatever the UKIP successor, whatever it happens to be at the time, would be. Uh, the Greens have got one MP, but I suspect they would get more. The Liberal Democrats, of course, would get more. Uh, and uh, that would be the first manifestation of the change. And then you might then start getting the political parties breaking up so that the Corbynistas would go off and set up a, a left-wing uh, Labour Party. You might start to see extreme left-wing views being represented in Parliament in a way they haven't been for many years. Uh, and yes, it, it would evolve. Would it change the nature of debate? I'm not so sure about that. And I, I don't think I've ever thought about it in those terms. I know people think that Westminster is very adversarial. Um, and it is, it's a bit like a crowded party, but people actually tend, even at Westminster today, to get on with each other much better than people realise. I have to say the Scottish Parliament, which after all has um, proportional representation at its heart, and indeed a model which I myself would be, think is probably the sort of one I would like to see implemented, I'm open to other suggestions, but it's one of them. Um, they're not nice to each other in the Scottish Parliament. <laughs> if you, uh, on the contrary, it's a rather boring place in my view. Uh, the fact that they don't even say, you know, the right honourable member and this, they just say Mr. So-and-so and Mrs. So-and-so and Ms. So -and -so, so So-and-so. It's a very rude and rather, <laughs> rather and, I, and I actually think the other thing is they all sit in their own seats, which is a disaster. Because it, it uh, whereas Parliament is a genuine debating chamber, you can sit where you want to for maximum effect. You can sit behind the minister, so you won't be rude to him. You can be <laughs> your own minister. It, it's much more subtle and much more entertaining. Now, I really don't think you should look to PR to creating a different sort of political noise necessarily at Westminster. I do think it will create a different attitude because people have to put coalitions together to govern. Now, you know, the only government of which I have ever been a part, although it's nowadays identified as conservative, <laughs> as he told <laughs> I happened to be a coalition government. Um, and it was in some ways very successful. I know it did the Lib Dems in, but that was because the Lib Dems supporters <laughs> failed to see their virtue. <laughs> Actually, they stepped up to the mark and they were a very important moderating influence. And you had all these, um, you had all the civil servants saying, you know, six or eight months in, this is extraordinary. The first time in my life I am seeing evidence-based decision-making. Because <laughs> <laughs> they weren't getting it under Tony Blair and so for government, and they weren't getting it under Gordon. They were actually very pleased. Of course, there was a counter to that. I remember going to give a talk at a Conservative think tank, and somebody said that some, I can't remember who it was in the audience, accused us of some populist policy. I can't remember who it was, and I said, you know, I think this is the least populist government that there have been for generations. And David Cameron stopped me in the corridor at, um, it made a headline, the attorney shouldn't make headlines. So David stopped me in the corridor at number 10 
He said, absolutely agree with you. He said, we are the least populist government in recent history, and that's the problem. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you, you've, got, you've got to, um, back to that, I think the noise will still be there, but there's a difference between noise and people's ability and willingness to cooperate. And I've seen often enough in politics that when you are constrained to cooperate, you can start making good decisions. And even if the public froth doesn't necessarily change. So please do not expect PR to deliver this sort of consensual, um, we are so polite to each other. Okay, so there'll be people out on the fringes who aren't in it will be even ruder. So you know, you, you've got to accept that politics is quite robust, but I still think it could make a significant benefit. There's only one rebuttal I want to make for that, which is that consensus decision making is not very polite. It really is. <laughs> and, um, yeah, it's a different type of decision making, yeah. but it, uh, it often contains the same amount of noise. And yeah. I completely mm -hmm. agree that actually, you know, however we end up um, choosing our representatives, we'll have a large amount of noise. And I think some of that is actually quite healthy. Mm -hmm. I think, well, we have about 15 minutes left, and I'd quite like to take a couple of comments from the floor. So if I could take, uh, Catherine, I know has been putting her hand up and down, so if I could take Catherine and then I could take Vicky, please. So Catherine. Well, um, interestingly enough, I have actually served in a parliament that was elected by proportional representation. Um, and uh, in the European parliament, we had many more political parties. Uh, European politics is much more, um, <laughs> led by personalities um, than, than we have here in the UK. Um, and we worked in, in political groups. Uh, in the political group, you would have a whole suite, and, and that would be your coalition, if you like. And we came to consensus before we went forward to the parliament. Uh, it was much more constructive. It took a lot longer to get to a decision. That's the downside, but the decisions were better in my mind. Excuse me, in my mind. Um, but I wanted to, um, uh, but we were very much, as you said, in, in the Scottish Parliament, uh, they're not particularly polite to each other. We were in the European Parliament. We all got on a cross-party. We had to build cross-party coalitions in order to get things through. Um, uh, but we were, the behaviour in the chamber was much better. And I think for me, as, uh, uh, as an aspiring politician, as I was some years ago, uh, looking at Westminster, um, I would say there is no way that I would want to go to that chamber. Uh, there is no aspect of anybody's working life where you stand up and you shout at each other. Mm -hmm. uh, in a, any business meeting, you, you, you work and you come to a consensus and you come to a decision. Um, you might not always agree with it, but this behaviour in the House of Commons is beyond belief. I mean, I wouldn't allow my children to behave like that. They have a voting system where you have to get up and walk down a corridor. I mean, you know, the whole place is barking mad. It puts people on politics. It's a great uh, source of entertainment for the Americans that look at it and, and think, you know, this is crazy. The Muppets come to mind. Um, and so, so for me, I think if we, we actually sorted out how our politicians behaved. And for me, I think what's missing in politics at the moment, we've got any number of sound bites, but we don't have the philosophy of what is what are the principles that people are standing for. They will stand for sound bites, they will stand for something, a, a quick a win on immigration or whatever. I would like to see more, more um, honesty and more, more um, philosophy in politics. Principles, less entertainment, more principles. Uh, Vicky, <laughs> there's lots of discussion about parties. Uh, and of course, when we talk about democracy and decision making, that's where we tend, that's where we tend to go. But I'm interested to know about what the population as a whole, and whether or not there are different opinions surfacing. And I have a feeling that there are. Uh, 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 Maybe I'm being over optimistic, but I have that sense that people have looked at what's been happening in Parliament, the Johnson, the Trust, the Sunak, the <coughs> positions, and all those politicians who have to resign or should be resigning. Yeah. Uh, and I say, this is not okay. 
uh, and I think the fact that that is represented in terms of measurement by the extent to which Labour's popularity as a party as a whole, as the polls show it, that is, has increased dramatically. And even under Sunak, who is a much more um, <laughs> attractive politician than some of the other politicians we've seen in terms of his manner, um, but I think that's that, that's very interesting. Um, and I think the fact that Starmer, who gets a lot of criticism in the left and in progressive people for not being very uh, 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 creative or not very uh, outspoken, is he knows that if Labour is going to win an election, he's got to get more than a simple majority of the voters. He's got to get about 12% more mm. than the Tories to even get into power. So that whole thing about going for the centre ground, mm. Yeah, is absolutely crucial to him. I don't think he's where he personally is. <clears throat> yeah, but I think he's where, in terms of, he knows Labour can't do anything unless he gets his power. So that's yeah. Um, so and, and also, so that whole thing about where the population is and whether or not I think the fact that the Labour Party has taken PR on board, well, it's taken some board into policy, but it doesn't just practice in the question. Um, but the fact that it, 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 it moves in that direction is an indication that people out there are seeing that things have got to change dramatically. Yeah? And I think the thing, you know, that message about taking back control, perfectly good issue. We all want to take back control. The answer, of course, was the wrong answer. <laughs> yeah? But I, I, I don't know whether or not you feel that there is some kind of movement, the generality of movement, which is which is very much taking account of where the centre ground is at the moment. And that's very interesting, the centre ground, not the extremes, are starting to think about we need major change. Thank you. I am slightly nervous of time, so I think I'm going to ask Gavin, then Dominic, to think about those then we will probably be at a point where we need to wrap up. We've got about 10 minutes left. So, Gavin, what I'm thinking about from those are, you know, the European Union being a personality-led, but Westminster having that entertainment value uh, rather than necessarily principle. And I think there's possibly something there to, to pull it back to PR almost, because quite a lot of our electoral system seems geared towards providing the entertainment of the big win on the night of the elections rather than necessarily a fairer vote. So there's something about entertainment versus sound principles. And then, as Vicky was saying, uh, where are the people? What's the people's views? And there, perhaps, as you know, you might be well placed to talk about whether you think the parties are following the people or whether people are following the media there. Okay, well, in, in terms of entertainment, uh, <laughs> it's not my idea of a night out watching Prime Minister's questions, I have to say. <laughs> I, you know, I, I've got a life. I, I, I'm not entirely sure. I mean, I remember one Prime Minister's questions about Brexit where Jeremy Corbyn stood up and said, I thought because it was a big moment for Labour, they could real problems for the government. He could have really laid into him. And his 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 first question was, would the prime minister agree with me that the treatment of the Chagos Islanders has been despicable? Now, I actually did agree with him that the treatment of the Chagos Islanders has been uh, uh, despicable, but it wasn't particularly salient. And I thought, my goodness, what 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 is the point of this? What, what why am I why am I even watching it? To be fair, though, I don't I don't think we're being fair to a lot of the work that goes on in Parliament, which is not done in the chamber, which is done in committees and is actually done by people of generally of goodwill who want to kind of get on and also want to solve problems. And I think the parliamentary committee system, uh, it won't be perfect. I've never been on one, but uh, Dominic maybe have, have views on this, but it does seem to work. There's many bits that that do work. Failing to listen to civil servants, however, I mean, they're, they're not the bosses. But not to listen to them. I mean, we have had a very odd time with our public servants recently being essentially derided and bullied, it would appear in some cases. And, and just to take one example, I, <laughs> our former ambassador to the United States, Sir Kim Darragh, was 
constructively dismissed. I mean, he resigned, but he resigned because his job was made impossible because he said something completely outrageous in a private letter, which is that Donald Trump is an incompetent and useless. I mean, who knew? Who of us knew? <laughs> we all knew that. And he was forced to resign by Trump, uh, the well-known liar, and by Boris Johnson, whose relationship with the truth has been always uh, somewhat attenuated. Uh, that, to me, struck me as something that is wrong with the system. Uh, and and the, the, in a sense, the debates in the chamber are obviously useful. They can be entertaining for some people, but I don't actually think most British people ever watch or pay attention to Prime Minister's questions. I just, I, I don't meet people who say, I mean, I meet people in this audience and, uh, uh, and in other people I deal with, but it's not a conversation I have when I go to buy fish from the fish shop down the road. Nobody ever talks about it. Certainly a niche hobby, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe niche to this audience. Um, personally, I'm quite pleased to hear you put that bit in about listening to civil servants. I used to be one, and <laughs> <laughs> ministers listen not quite as much as they could do. Um, Dominic, the entertainment versus principles question, but also whether the whether parties are following what the people think you know, whether they are all going to the centre ground. And that question around whether whether the people are following the media or whether the parties are following the people, you know, how do people get their ideas in the first place, I suppose? I mean, there's a topic on which I went down. I could go on for a rather long time, so I just tried to restrain myself. I'm just trying to take it in stages. Um, Prime Minister's questions is not representative of what goes on in the House of Commons. Um, unfortunately, it is the one thing that most people watch. It is hugely entertained, a uh, big entertainment value in the United States. I don't think actually particular entertainment value here, uh, but nevertheless, and it's partly Tony Blair's fault. It used to be two 15-minute chunks to the Prime Minister on the Tuesday and the Thursday. He replaced it by this marathon 30, 40, and the John Burko 55 minute session on a Wednesday, thereby giving it a prominence that was much greater than it should have been. The 15 minute bite size, what are you doing at the moment? Questions was very much better. I don't know if any future Prime Minister will go back to it, probably not, because it suited Tony Blair to have it all concentrated at lunchtime for the media. Lunchtime for the media at one o'clock was all staged to do exactly that. So he is actually to blame for the current state of Prime Minister's questions in part. Um, MPs do not use Parliament in the way they should. Now, that is a much bigger media problem. You are going to get, if you make a nice speech in the House of Commons, which may be appreciated by the 40 or 50 people who are present, perhaps max 30 if it's a late evening speech, something which is really good, and makes a good contribution, you're, um, you are going to register 0 0.5 on the Richter scale. If you decide not to make a speech, but succeed in getting yourself on Newsnight, then you may actually appeal to a wider audience. So Parliament in that sense is marginalised, and the committee system is particularly bad, because that's where bills should be properly scrutinised, and most MPs don't go in to do it at all, they go in to do it as a chore, leaving it to the party spokesman to make all the running, can you make a difference? Yes, you can. I mean, I once tabled 318 amendments to a bill where I was the government junior spokesman. Uh, it was called the um, it was called the Proceeds of Crime Act, which was extremely poorly drafted. And I think you know, out of the 318, I got about 35 amendments accepted by the government. I think it's a better bill as a consequence. We were doing what we were supposed to do. So I don't think you should judge Parliament. Second thing, by PMQ, second thing. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to disagree on this. I actually think a slightly rowdy parliament is probably quite important to safety valve. It's the place where people go to be rowdy. Um, if they think their constituents feel very passionately about something, you may not like George Galloway, but when George came along to vent his fury, which he did over Iraq on a number of occasions, you know, they were parliamentary moments, and he had a justification for coming along and doing that. He thought he was representing his constituent element of his constituents' interests. So, the question, that doesn't matter. It matters if government and opposition in the sense of the leaders start to be contaminated by this rhetoric. 
Now, yeah, that brings me to the second point, which is about what do the public want? Well, fortunately, I think the evidence is becoming pretty overwhelming. The public think that the idea of quiet government isn't such a bad idea. Um, it's what I go and pray for on a Sunday in my Anglican church, <laughs> but we haven't actually been given it very much. Yet it's always been at the root of what UK governments have thought they ought to be delivering, certainly until Boris Johnson. Um, even with the froth around the edges. And so I happen to think Keir Starmer's onto a winner here, uh, picking up the question that was raised. I think people would like a bit of dullness and a bit of centre ground rationality. And if he's capable of delivering it and he can marry it to a bit of pizzazz because a bit of charisma helps, then I think he may well just steam it at the next general election. Because I'm not sure the public are going to forgive the Conservative Party for what they have succeeded in doing in the last six years, which has been chaotic. Um, even if they voted for the chaos, or 29% of them, whatever it is, the voting metric voted for Brexit, <laughs> for this particular form of chaos. Um, and um, so maybe we are on the cusp. The truth is, our politics have been becoming resolutely more populist, more manipulated, more about the message and less about the content. And this has been a growing phenomenon for 30 or 40 years. It goes back a long way. We say it started in the 60s and 70s. It's about mass media and communication. Tony Blair, I'm afraid, greatly enhanced it. The arrival of skin doctors, fads, all these extras who are, in my view, not very decorative. Even the Attorney General. I hope the new one will get rid of the fad. But but Suella was the first attorney to ever accept a political advisor in her office, whereas I was new, but I was also told by my permanent secretary that such a thing would be completely unacceptable because of the attorney's role. And David Cameron was thinking I might have one. Um, and in fairness, David accepted that without any difficulty. And that's where the contamination has crept in. So if we can get back to a little bit of rigour in government, and observing the norms, and Keir is able to deliver that. In fairness, Rishi may be hoping to deliver that, and he's certainly moving in that direction, but he's dealing with a deeply dysfunctional political party, mm -hmm. uh, which he can't really control. So actually, I think if that happens, you may get more quiet government, but we certainly need it. Um, but as I say, I wouldn't conflate quiet government with cockpit of the nation about the House of Commons. I, I know there's a bit of this slight obsession that we must make the House of Commons a much better, nicer place. And I agree. I think that in media terms for the public, it's very negative. I think the noise and the anger and everything else doesn't go down well. It goes down well with an audience watching it as a piece of theatre. But it has always been around. Uh, and I think that you're going to lose something as well if it's not a place where people become so sanitised that you cannot have controversial, difficult views being expressed uh, in the course of political discourse. Thank you very much. We have time for about two sentences from each of our uh, uh, panellists here. Um, so I'd like to ask each of them, Gavin first and then Dominic, to tell me something that they think would strengthen democracy. What, what's the one thing that you change that would benefit democracy? And then that will be the end of the session, I'm afraid. So Gavin first. Well, very quickly on the, in terms of the media, uh, the concept of balance, which I agree with, we should have balance and debates and so on, but we shouldn't attempt to balance somebody who knows what they're talking about, who's got some expertise with somebody who works for a supposed think tank whose funding is somewhat dodgy and who has simply got a view. I have got a view about dentistry. I could come and have a look at your teeth, but I wouldn't have a clue what to do. I'd suggest you go to a dentist. Uh, so phony balance, get rid of it. That is an excellent point. <laughs> well, that's an easy start, particularly because um, it's where it is. Um, the government's ethics advisor, I would turn in to a statutory uh, post, being the ethics advisor on government to parliament. So that um, in the event of there being an ethical issue in government, it is Parliament who has given the power to the ethics advisor 
to investigate the matter and report back to the House of Commons as to whether he thinks the ethical standards in government have been met by the government itself. That's the first little change I would introduce. And I don't see any reason why Parliament couldn't do that, apart from the fact, I suppose, that the Prime Minister might try to use his parliamentary majority to prevent it. But I think it would be greatly in the Prime Minister's interest. You know, would recommend it to Rishi and say, why don't you do that? Instead of having the ethics advisor appointed by you, the ethics advisor is there to watch over government, to meet its ethical standards that you yourself have said you intend to meet. But the report is made to Parliament and you can't prevent it being made. I like what so much. Thank you to Gavin. Thank you very much. Thank you to our audience. Um, 